Hey, welcome. We're looking today at a really interesting new uh, statement, a declaration that's been made by a group of pastors called Clergy for Conscience. And I have some guests here with me today, and I'd like each one to just very briefly introduce themselves. What's your name? Where are you from? And uh, say hello, and we can just jump in and get started here. So uh, let's start with, uh, with Pastor Alvaro. Yes, Alvaro Sousa and from Sandpoint, Idaho, Upper Columbia Conference. I'm a retired minister. Very good. Jonathan. Yes, uh, I'm a trial attorney. I live in Momolinda, California. Uh, recently, I seem to have uh, been involved in a lot of religious liberty issues. All right, Jay. I'm a constitutional lawyer. I'm Canadian, and uh, uh, I do constitutional law, civil liberties work. All righty. And I see um, Holly. I am Holly Jores. We live in north central Arkansas, and it's a hot place for Adventists that are trying to move the city, move out of the cities these days. So I'm active in the local church here in Clinton. Very good. Welcome aboard. I'm, I'm Larry Kirkpatrick. I'm a pastor up here in the state of Michigan, and uh, I have the Muskegon and Fremont churches. There is a statement that just came out last week by a group of pastors. You'll find it if you haven't seen it before. It's on um, clergyforconscience.org. It's called A Christian Declaration of Conscience, The Relationship Between the State, the Church, and the Individual. And it is about five paragraphs long, and then there's like six bullet points. And this is a statement uh, that a group of pastors have made. Our goal is to look at it and have a discussion about the content of this statement. It seems like a very pertinent statement. I know that as I read it through very closely, I signed it on Friday, and um, I'm sure there are many others signing it. And there's probably a lot of people that do not even know it exists. So uh, we want to find out what this what this statement is about. Well, I'll summarize one thing. Um, it reminds me of Romans 14, 12, which says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It just reminds us we answer directly to God and we do not need interference. We do not want interference in the issues that we're wrestling with right now. I think there's been maybe a feeling, at least I've had a feeling, that there's been a little bit of interference in recent times. So anybody else, a quick reaction, and then maybe we should uh, read some piece of it real quick and, and take a look at it. As a pastor, I saw this statement as something that was very timely. You know, it, it addresses the most fundamental awareness of uh, um, of what is right and wrong. And, and if we're going to have religious freedom... Um, there's something more basic than that, and that would be our liberty of conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to uh, be free, whether uh, we we believe in God or not. You know, we all have a conscience, and it begins there. And we need to uh, understand that we uh, need to protect that, not only for ourselves as believers and as people of faith, but for everyone. And I think this statement addresses it in the context of, of um, uh, you know, uh, Christians, but even broader than that, in the context of, of the human uh, need and, and uh, context. You know, that's an interesting distinction you've made, because I think a lot of people might not even start by making that distinction. But, but uh, Pastor Alvaro, you made a distinction between religious liberty and conscience and said that actually conscience is actually precedent or it's before the theme of religious liberty. It's kind of getting down to the really bare, bare metal. Uh, conscience is kind of the bottom line and everything else kind of comes, I think, comes from that. That's what I think I hear you're saying. Yes, it's, it's fundamental. I, um, it, it's broader than religious liberty. Um, religious liberty is is um, founded on the understanding that we have all been given by God uh, an awareness of, of right and wrong, um, a consciousness of morality, and and that's where we need to begin. Um, I actually have uh, printed out the statement here, 
off the website, and I thought maybe I would just read the first paragraph. Conscience is the gift of God in the medium by which God communicates with man. It is hallowed ground. It is the basis of free will. The inviolability of conscience is the essence of religious freedom. All are endowed with the God-given right to follow their conscience. Walking in the footsteps of Christ, the apostles and reformers, the true church always teaches liberty of conscience for all. Mm -hmm. And then there's, uh, I don't know how many scriptures here, a number of scriptures listed here. Is, is this something that uh, our culture is, uh, is really good at and we're just kind of adding some extra pieces or is our culture today uh, struggling with conscience? I don't know. I don't know how the case is in Canada, if it's any better or worse than America, but it seems like there's a lot of challenges basically all over the Western world. The Western world has slipped into a debate and an understanding, I would say, really, that rights come from the state. And so there's been a repudiation of that basic principle that rights come from God. And uh, really, humanity is, is in the process of re-examining the question of liberty because of lockdowns and vaccine mandates. Humanity is having this conversation about where rights come from. And it's, it is a self-evident truth that if the state ceased to exist today, there would still be human beings. And the state does not make your mouth or your ears or your mind, and it doesn't make your body. And yet the state has presumed to take it upon itself to compel people as a condition of the exercise of their civil liberties, that they're going to take an experimental medication or a new medication, if you don't like the word experimental. And, and so that engages people's individual rights. And some in the state and some in the church would tell you that, well, rights come from the state and your, your job is just to do what the state says, even as a Christian. Uh, but others would say, no, that's not the case. My rights come from God. And there are some rights that the state cannot take away because the state did not give them in the first place. So this is the conversation that's playing out all around the world right now. Yeah. Uh... Pastor Kirkpatrick, I just wanted to make a comment on that. Yeah. Um, I, I agree completely um, with that statement that uh, that uh, we're in a world right now where there's this attempt to try to make it look like our rights come from the state. Uh, one of the things that I really like about this document is it does a great, great job of giving a classic definition of conscience. And if you look at the history of religious liberty, it really does center around this issue. And the thing that has been uh, most disturbing to me is that uh, other than a few scattered congregations here and there, there hasn't been any organized, um, I feel like the, or the, the major denominations have somehow forgotten um, where religious liberty came from, and, and they haven't made this kind of a statement. And so I'm extremely encouraged that a group of pastors would get together and put together this kind of a statement, because this really is a classic, uh, a classic way of, of looking at our rights and, and, and where they really came from. You know, uh, since you brought that up, um, I'm, maybe I'm just out of the loop, but I don't recall seeing any, any denomination or any church. I mean, I mean, zero. I don't think any church group a formalized denomination has made a statement like this. Um, can you point me to one? Is this is this actually kind of like a very unique thing? Because you'd think that out of the hundreds or thousands, I guess many thousands of different groups, denominational groups, you'd think there would be some kind of a statement in this line. But uh, I don't know of one except except for this. Yeah, as far as I know, this is this is the only statement. I know that. Um... There have definitely been some congregations that have individual congregations have stood up to the state um, during this pandemic, and and uh, I would guess that uh, they uh, they are doing it based on a rationale similar to this. But as far as a statement and just a really good definition of of conscience and and, and liberty of conscience and why it matters, um, this is the only one that I'm aware of. And Larry, I think that as as a pastor, and I, I know I'm not alone. I mean, uh, the, the pastors that have contributed and been involved in uh, putting this statement together, 
I, I think for the most part, their motivation has been um, the, the lack of uh, having our church step up to the plate and take a, um, a, a role, a, a, an active role in helping the members that many of them feel uh, marginalized and um, not understood that have that have been uh, against uh, a mandate uh, and not necessarily uh, against vaccines per se but 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 the idea of the state determining whether you uh, need to take this um, this new and and different type of vaccine um, you know that that really clashed and 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 for many of us as um, pastors and and members um, lay lay members it was very disappointing <laughs> that our church was not there when we had to uh, answer to our employers um, and and many have have uh, had difficulty um, it could have been a lot worse thank god that that it didn't go all the way but but uh, there was still many of our people that uh, conscientiously could not uh, accept uh, a vaccine and and the church wasn't there to to just stand with them and say um, this individual uh, and, and recognize that it was it was a question of conscience and and it's legitimate it's based on the on the word of god and 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 the church is supportive of that decision that statement was not clear at all um and and again for many of us we felt that the church had failed us so maybe another uh, kind of a primitive starting place uh, we maybe need to start with. What are religious liberty issues and what are not religious liberty issues? Uh, it seems like these past 24 months, it seems very much to me that uh, we've really been facing, I mean, when the government is telling you things such as uh, your church is closed, you need to keep your church closed, or you can have this many people to do worship, or uh, you, you, you know, uh, you have to have only 25% of capacity, or you have to take maybe a certain treatment. Uh, these things seem very um, plainly to me uh, that these are incursions into the into an area of personal conscience. And um, but maybe I'm wrong. But I guess I'm asking all of you um, because there seems to be I don't see the religious liberty departments really rushing to the front to help us here. Um, maybe I could ask each one of you in turn, uh, do you think these kinds of things that we're talking about here, are these legitimate religious liberty issues, or is this uh, it's kind of like personal preference, and uh, if the collective state says you've got to do it the other way, we just we just stand in line and stand on the dot and do what we're told? Or is this religious liberty issues we're talking about or not? I think Absolutely. You know, um, I, I think about scripture tells us that our body is the temple of God. And we also know that uh, we're a royal priesthood. What does the priest do? The priest takes care of the temple. And also, if you look at, at Christ, when he's asked the question about taxation, he holds up the coin and he says, um, whose face is on this? And Caesar's face was on it. It's the image of Caesar on that coin. And he said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. But but we're made in the image of God. So God's mm -hmm. image is, is upon us. Um, one of the things though, you raise a very interesting question, and this is a question that the courts have to wrestle with a lot. Now the courts um, don't really like to get involved in religious disputes. In fact, American courts will do their very best to stay out and generally succeed. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed with reading some of the cases is that the courts are faced with the question about whether or not something is religious in nature or not. And what they do, they're not likely to go to scripture the way I just did. But what I've seen them doing is they are going to the denominations and asking them, maybe not directly asking them, but they're certainly observing 
whether there are any denominations that think that it is a religious issue. And when you see the silence of the denominations or even perhaps worse, where the denomination perhaps isn't silent, but even um, proactively in favor of vaccines um, and, and perhaps uh, the mandatory taking of vaccines, or at least apathetic about it, it creates a situation where the court says, why are you here before me? Your church or all the churches say this is not religious. So, so it's very easy then for the court to then say that it's not religious. And this is a real travesty. And this is why statements like this uh, are very important. And it's very important for people to come behind them and, and support them and sign them. I think what our church and, and, and probably most of the other churches have not come to terms and don't realize that for some people, it may not be a, 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 reli a religious issue. Their decision to, to uh, take the vaccine and, and fulfill the requirement by the state is, you know, it, it's, it's not based on uh, uh, whether it's gonna be good, or good for me or not. Uh, or give glory to God or not. In fact, they may think that that receiving the vaccine is giving glory to God. You know, it's it's um, cooperating with with the state. And and I'm I'm all for cooperating with the state until that point where I feel and I believe that it's infringement on my faith. The reason for for following the health message is a faith reason for me. First Corinthians 10, 31. Um, wh whatever I eat, drink, whatever I do, I do to the glory of God. And this, this um, uh, pandemic and how we dealt with it, how I personally um, dealt with it in my life and my home was based on my belief of the God-given health principles that I find in his word and the spirit of prophecy. It's part of my faith, the way I live, uh, how I practice uh, eating, drinking, and whatever I do, it, it is based on my faith. And, and for the church to say this isn't a, a religious issue, that really is a disappointment. It's, it's um, a, a letdown because of the uh, fundamental beliefs that we have right. to, to serve God, to, to live by every word that proceeds from his mouth, and even the word that we hear behind us say, this is the way, walk ye in it. I, I would like my church to recognize that this can very well be for a large number of our uh, members a religious issue and please stand with me and help me Amen. so yeah any uh is this a religious liberty issue a couple of you more left uh what do you I'll think tag, i'll tag on to what's just been said by the previous two i really like jonathan's presentation on the two tables of the law and I did see a part of a weekend that they did in Arizona on that very good discussion. Romans 13, people may point to, oh, we have to, you know, give to the state what they ask for. But the context there is the second table of the law, love your neighbor as yourself. And so the first temple or the first table, of the law belongs to God. There are many Bible stories that can inform us. But one I just was looking at again yesterday is in 2 Kings 16, when King Ahaz of Judah, he was besieged by Assyria, and he surrendered to Tiglath-Pileser. He gave him silver and gold from the temple, and then he visited him in Damascus, and then he sent back a copy of the altar for his priest, Urijah, God's priest, to copy, and things rapidly went down downhill. How do you draw the line when you start giving Caesar control of God's body temple? you're eventually going to give him everything. You're eventually going to worship him with everything he asks for. And that's what we saw in Ahaz's story. 
and then put that with the hymn that we sing. I'm a church musician, so I'm thinking about hymns. Uh, number 316 in our hymnal, it says, live out thy life within me. Mm, amen. And so it talks about my body. The temple has been yielded and purified of sin. Let thy Shekinah glory now shine forth from within and all the earth keep silence. The body, my body, henceforth be thy silent gentle servant moved only as by thee and it goes on it's Amen. members it's not the church members it's the members of my body my body is god's temple this is very very plain whether someone knows it or not it is a religious liberty issue for them i believe what we do with our body but maybe we're not educated maybe our conscience is an uninformed conscience and there's all types of conscience that the Bible talks about. And it's still a valid issue that we should address. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. The, one of the things that sticks out to me is that you have principles on which the Christian religion rests. You have clear uh, foundational ideas. And the repudiation of those ideas is a red flag. So anytime in the scripture where the government says, where the, where the, where the state says, you're going to do X, Right. And and there's people who resist that because of their conscience. Pharaoh said to all the midwives, you're going to kill all the babies. And the midwives had a decision to make at that point, whether or not they were going to honor God or whether they were going to honor the state. And they made a decision. Saul said to Jonathan, uh, I want you to bring David. I want you to tell me where he is. He's going to be king. If you don't help me destroy him. And Jonathan had a decision to make. And uh, the apostles were told, you will not preach in this name. And so every single time the state says you are not going to do something and God has said, yes, you're going to do something, you have a decision to make. And so the people who are saying Romans 13 and you have to do whatever the state says are ignoring, are ignoring the preponderance of evidence in the scriptures that, that acknowledges and, and defends your right as an individual to make a choice for the sake of honoring God and his commandments. And so, you know, we know in Revelation chapter 13 that there's going to be a mark and that everybody who doesn't have the mark will not be able to buy and sell. And in, in other places around the world, not as much as in the United States, not as much in the United States, but in Canada, certainly in other places around the world, there have been restrictions on civil liberties, the ability to buy groceries, the ability to travel, the ability to get on a plane or a train, the ability to worship, uh, the ability to work. And so when you have people saying this is not a religious liberty issue, you, you have to ask them, well, is there a commandment that I work and feed my family? If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. It stays. Is that a biblical imperative or what? And so if you say it's not a religious liberty issue, you're also saying that everything that follows from your tacit acquiescence to a state mandate, which overrides your conscience and interferes with your civil liberties, all of the resulting things that the state does that are, uh, you know, if they lock you in your house and they prevent you from buying groceries, all of that stuff is also not a religious liberty issue if you take that line of thought to its logical conclusion. And so at what point do people, do Christians say, does the denomination say enough is enough? Mm -hmm. You're way over the line here. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then it becomes the duty of an individual. You can't wait for somebody to say this is wrong. If the whole world says something is right and it's wrong, it's still wrong. Mm. Well, I yeah, let me read. Uh, let me read a couple more paragraphs. There's five paragraphs all together. I'm going to read the second and third paragraph because I think this is a good segue to it. I mean, basically, what you've said, uh, Brother Cameron, is is um, you know, if if this is if these aren't religious liberty issues, you know. Like, then what is? <laughs> Where after this, it, and what uh, Holly said, if we let the state control our body, then what's left? Um, but anyway, let me, let me read this, and I want to get your reaction to this. The state must not, in, this is the second and third paragraph, the state must not encroach upon the dictates of a person's conscience, nor tread upon God's calling for the church. The church must not become an organ of the state. The state may not invoke science to violate the conscience of individuals or nullify the teachings of scripture, thus enforcing a single totalitarian order of human life. The church must not impede the promptings of the Holy Spirit upon an individual's conscience, 
nor do the biddings of the state by denigrating believers' consciences. The clergy must be free to nurture members in matters of conscience in accordance with clear, inspired revelation and support them wherever their liberties are threatened. And I guess, let me just stop at that. That's, that's the biggest paragraph here. And there's a lot there, but it talks about the state, the, the church, and the individual. And it says, basically, the, the state shouldn't fuzz out over into the church, and the church should not uh, fog out over into the state. The church must not impede the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So these are pretty serious kinds of issues, if indeed these are this is where we are. It is where we are. The beautiful thing is, if we are truly Bible-based, Berean Seventh-day Adventist, so to speak, we should be referencing and reviewing stories like Jay mentioned, and there are others of, you know, especially we think of Daniel. Daniel did not have the benefit of an organized church to give him a statement to follow or anything. He had to go on his own personal study and understanding of prophecy and the will of God. And so my question for those issuing the statement is, are we including in the statement the challenge to whoever signs it? Do you know that you need to be prepared to stand alone? Do you know that this freedom of conscience that we're so interested in costs many people their lives? So, yeah, good question there. Uh, this is a statement for, uh, as I understand it, for pastors to sign and for non-pastors to sign. I mean, you can sign as a pastor, just like some people could sign, I think, a statement that the health uh, alliance, uh, Liberty and Health Alliance, you could sign that statement as a as a physician or whatever, you know, different categories. This is a statement uh, prepared by pastors and for pastors, but also for every church member. And I guess from a legal standpoint, because we have two attorneys here with us, um, I'm wondering how does this statement provide uh, does this statement provide any legal help for church members, or is this just kind of a fun thing like, yeah, I've got nothing better to do today. I guess I'll just uh, type it in and sign my name on this. Uh, does this statement have any, it's not an official uh, denominational statement, but does this have any legal helps for uh, possibly for church members, maybe a church member who is facing, uh, you, gotta, you have to receive a certain treatment or else you'll be fired is there any is there any way that this statement might be helpful uh in a legal standpoint to somebody who's facing maybe losing their their position or their career jay or john uh, jonathan or anybody well i think the answer is yes but only in a limited sense we're in a situation where many times when you go in front of the court uh the court was going to look at this and say well it's not it's not a religious issue and by um by looking at a document like this um, you may be able to say there are a, no, a lot of religious people, people that understand religion, clergy members um, that have signed this document, and therefore you could use this perhaps as some kind of uh, persuasive evidence to try to get the court to, to view your um, issue in the lens of, of religion. That's, that's the, main, the main way that, uh, that I see this from a legal standpoint. Um, I'm not sure how much effect that would actually have. It would depend a lot upon the court and, and the individual judges. As the statement says, it's prepared by, by Seventh-day Adventist clergy. And of course, anybody, I guess, can sign it, non-Adventist or a Hindu or anybody. Yeah, well, if you have enough pastors signing this, um, it could create a really interesting situation where you have the Religious Liberty Department saying one thing, and perhaps some of the leaders in the General Conference saying one thing, and the pastors saying another thing. Um, I don't think they have to be um, in disagreement with each other, but um, I, I kind of feel like one of the one of the basics of American jurisprudence is that whatever a denomination says, it's not binding on anyone. It's mm -hmm. not binding on the members. Um, in American jurisprudence, what you believe is what you believe personally, and it's always focused on the personal belief. Now, certainly having a denomination behind you that believes the same thing is great evidence of personal belief but that's not the that's not what the court is really looking at so anyway i think that this is an important document to to, to have um if nothing else uh, it can get the conversation going a little bit more um within the denominations so jay um 
Canada, as I've watched across the border, since because I haven't been there since uh, since COVID time, uh, crossed it many times, but not since then. Um, I, I kind of tend to look with a certain amount of grimness when I look across to the north, because it just seems like there were so many kind of things happening up there in different respects about freedom of speech, pandemic things. How what is the legal situation in Canada for church members right now? Um, is conscience something that the, is this something that people are all tuned up on? Is the government tuned up on it? Or is conscience, is it more of what the, the government says? Or is it more, there's a more interest in what the individual thinks? Because it, from, from, from down here, it looks a little bit like, uh, like in Canada, you might be in a, a, tighter, a tighter space uh, than you are in America even. The church isn't getting a lot of love from the state, I guess. All right. So there's a couple things there. First of all, uh, under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, under Section 2A, conscience is actually the first ground that is protected, but there's very little jurisprudence or case law which protects conscience rights. It hasn't been considered a whole lot. The question has been religion. And the older case law says that there has to be a clear nexus uh, between your personal belief and religion but not necessarily a denominational statement, just a religious, uh, a religious creed. And so you know, that's where a statement like this could come in. But increasingly what's happened is, is employment, employers and the government in Canada have looked to see what the denomination is doing. And so you have thousands of people in Canada who have lost their jobs because of the statement of the general conference, uh, the statements saying um, that, that uh, this, this uh, you know, forced vaccination, um, employer vaccination mandates, they do not constitute a religious liberty issue. And so uh, I think somebody was saying earlier that not only is the denomination not getting involved in the conversation, but they're, they're, they're consenting to the oppression. And, and so that's been a major problem. Um, you know, there's, there's a, it, does this help in Canada? It does because uh, under the human rights legislation, lots of the provinces have protections for creed. And so you can point to this and say, this is my creed with respect to conscience, irrespective of what my denomination is doing. And as, as a Protestant denomination, we take the Bible as the standard of truth. And so if the denomination goes sideways, then they spend 40 years out in the wilderness in left field. Uh, I hope it won't that be that, uh, I hope it won't be that long. Uh, but you know, that doesn't mean that we go with them. They could do whatever they want, right? But we have a right to say the Bible is our creed. These are the biblical principles that we stand on. Here's a statement of our faith, uh, this, this statement from the uh, clergy. And so I think it's helpful. But the reality is, is that one in a thousand requests for religious exemption in Canada are being approved currently. And the mandates have been yeah. rescinded for the most part. But one in a thousand approved? That's correct. One in a thousand. So that's the same exactly. as saying 999 out of a thousand. Uh, it's like uh, go fish. Yeah, that's correct. And I think that they're, you know, for the vast majority of Seventh-day Adventists, the people who are saying, no, you're not going to be accommodated, those employers and those government entities are looking at the general conference statement saying, your own church says this is not a religious liberty issue. Now, if I could say one point on that, and I'll, quick, and then I'll be quiet. <clears throat> These clergy who have put this statement together, they've gotten together, they've studied the scriptures, they've put together a statement. There is nothing in the Adventist constitution in the bylaws of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which make ADCOM's statement authoritative any more than this statement authoritative and binding on the rights of conscience and religion of the members. And I think people need to remember that. I know that that's going to get me in hot water for saying that maybe, but that's just the facts. In, in a Protestant religion, no Protestant who understands Protestantism and biblical Christianity cedes the authority to some group of people, be there five or 20 or 50, to declare what is a denominational belief, which is binding on your own conscience. It's totally antithetical to the principles of Protestantism. Nobody would do that. Mm. Wow. That I think that's a little... a short yeah, story. go ahead. I just have a short encouraging story from our conference, Arkansas, Louisiana. I'm familiar with a church member whose pastor would not help him, maybe he felt like he was uh, not supposed to, would not help him with his exemption letter. And so he went to his head elder and they did some research, used some of the material by uh, Jonathan's group and um, 
found some help and submitted the letter and the employer did give the exemption and he said that he consulted the conference statement they had issued a video um, basically saying we are not for these mandates and so because the local conference which is in arkansas uh, was considered by that employer to be more authoritative than the more distant body and, and the statement made by ADCOM. In this case, it worked out that he got the exemption. Praise God. Wow. So that was helpful. So it sounds like there would even be a benefit if, um, if local uh, state conferences or provinces um, Right. If, if, if they actually looked at a statement, this statement or something like it, or made their own statement, uh, actually standing in support of their members, uh, freedom of conscience, that that actually might, uh, because the case you have is that there was a case that the very thing that that, that conference stood up for its members and that helped that, that member. They basically, the employer basically said, we don't care about what the guys in Washington, D.C. are saying. We care about what your local... Um, church organization is saying. Let me read another uh, paragraph. This is paragraph three in the statement, because I'm thinking a lot of people watching this video may not have even known the statement exists. I know it just came out on Friday or something last week, but uh, let's see, third paragraph. Each individual has the unalienable right mm -hmm. to care for their body based upon the dictates of their own conscience without organizational or governmental interference. Daniel was honored by God when he demonstrated this principle by purposing in his heart not to defile himself with the king's food. The right to bodily integrity is rooted in the biblical principle that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a long list of scriptures there that go with it. The right to bodily integrity is rooted in the biblical principle that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I would think nobody would be disputing that. I mean, are they the temple of the Holy Spirit? Are they the temple of Caesar? You know, what's interesting is, is if you look at, at civil rights law and constitutional law in the United States, um, this has been one of the foundational um, assumptions um, for all liberty, and it goes beyond, far beyond even religion. Um, and really, it's it's related to this, not exactly the same, but, but this idea of bodily integrity um, this is the foundation of the atheists that are arguing for abortion rights. And they recognize this as a foundational freedom. And if you don't have bodily integrity, you honestly don't have anything. And if you look at uh, a lot of the modern totalitarian regimes, um, bodily integrity was one of the chief ways that, that they would attack the, uh, the dissidents in the state. Um, I don't really want to, you know, we, we could go there. But um, anyway, to me, this is so foundational to the actual word freedom that uh, I can't I can't think that this is that anyone would rightfully uh, uh, want to want to counter this. Something interesting about Daniel. He had a witness in the Babylonian kingdom, and we see his first stand, of course, was what he would take into his body. And there were other stands but I believe Nebuchadnezzar's conversion, can we call it, um, progression of thought and acceptance of truth came because of Daniel and his friends who were willing to take a stand, starting with their freedom of conscience in what they would put into their body. That was a witness. That was a powerful witness when that king saw how God vindicated them and God gave them wisdom after they had taken that stand. Right. Without Daniel 1, I don't think there's a Daniel chapter 3 or a Daniel chapter 6. That's right. That's right. Oh, I'm, I'm going back. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit. But I, you know, I, I was very disappointed about my church. <laughs> and the lack of sensitivity and understanding that so many of the members were standing on the 28 fundamental beliefs, on the word of God, and we're making a decision based on their understanding and how, how, how they, uh, uh, the, the research that they had done, whatever. Uh, uh, they were conscientiously against the mandate, against this new 
vaccine, different vaccine. Uh, they were not against vaccines, but they were against this vaccine, this mandate. And the church wasn't there. And so, you know, I, I and I, I'd like to, I'd like to hear um, a some comments um, by uh, one or both of our attorneys here. You know, what um, is this? Is this something that have we changed? Has our church now? Um, what is the hesitancy of our church in? standing for, with our members and uh, uh, accepting the fact that for some of us, it's a matter of conscience. It's a religious liberty issue. Let me let me read uh, Fundamental Belief. Now, I know this, this is for everybody, not just a certain church here, but for, for the Seventh-day Adventists, which many of you will be Seventh-day Adventists watching this, I want to read our Fundamental Belief number 22, because I think that touches back to what you're speaking to, Alvaro. Um, I want to hear from us. Uh, is this statement, it seems to me like it's in harmony with fundamental belief 22, the one about health. I'm going there now. Because if the statement's in harmony with fundamental belief number two, I wonder if the, the statements that have caused us some concern that have come out, as was indicated, maybe without a lot of actual authority behind them, maybe those statements are out of harmony with the fundamental belief. Uh, anyway, this is fundamental belief 22, Christian behavior. We are called to be a godly people who think, feel, and act in harmony with the biblical principles in all aspects of personal and social life. For the Spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, we involve ourselves only in those things that will produce Christ-like purity, health, and joy in our lives. This means that our amusement and entertainment should meet the highest standards of Christian taste and beauty. While recognizing cultural differences, our dress is to be simple, modest, and neat, befitting those whose true beauty does not consist of outward adornment, but in the imperishable ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit. It also means that because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, we are to care for them intelligently. Along with adequate exercise and rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from unclean foods identified in the scriptures. Since alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and the irresponsible use of drugs and narcotics are harmful to our bodies, we are to abstain from them as well. Instead, we are to engage in whatever brings our thoughts and bodies into the discipline of Christ who desires our wholesomeness, joy, and goodness, Fun, unquote. So that's the fundamental belief 22. And when I read this, this statement, uh, it sounds to me like it's in complete consonance. It's in complete harmony with fundamental belief 22. And when I read the two or three other statements that have come out, sort of saying they're kind of like, well, vaccine, yes, or vaccine, no, do what you want. But they really seem to be supporting, sustaining vaccination and, and a, a sort of a belittling a, a, a any other viewpoint. Uh, I felt like those might not be in harmony with our fundamental belief statement, whereas this one is. But, I don't know, reactions. Maybe back to uh, Jay, too. I don't want to push anybody, but um, we were just talking about the legal situation, the question that Alvaro asked. Maybe I just didn't see it, but the church's statement should be consistent with themselves, and the members should be have the support of the church in supporting their fundamental beliefs, shouldn't they? It's a fundamental principle of Christianity that we're made in the image of God, and he has bestowed upon humanity the right of individual choice. That is part of the legacy that comes to us from the Creator. So when the denomination says, we are deciding, and, and this is not a denominational position that has been formulated from, uh, from a general conference session, which the Constitution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church requires that denominational statements be created and voted by the membership in general conference session, a meeting of the delegates. So this statement was created by ADCOM. Uh, you know, pastors, conferences, divisions, nobody had any input into this. And yet, this is a statement that is supposed to be authoritative. Well, you're overriding the individual conscience of a person who is created in the image of God. They have their own body, they have their own responsibilities to the Creator, and they have their own minds to make a decision. And you know, anybody who has an internet connection these days can see that these shots 
are created by giant pharmaceutical companies, many of whom have a very spotty record. And so you're going to tell people it's not a religious liberty issue to be compelled by your employer to take a shot that comes from a company that you know, Pfizer has the distinction of making the largest criminal fraud settlement in U.S. history at $2.3 billion for the fraudulent uh, promotion of pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. That's not a religious liberty issue. Are you kidding me? I mean, like, are we even talking about this? The, I mean, I, I mean, who are these people yeah. that they're saying that this is not a religious liberty issue? I, you know, and where do they think that they get the authority to say that? I mean, these are some incredibly. Er I mean, I look. You know, you said speak freely, so I'll tell you. These are some incredibly <laughs> arrogant people to say that we have the authority to say on behalf of uh, of a church that has millions of people. You got 50 people, 56 people, and they're going to tell the church what is or is not a, a matter of conscience with respect to new pharmaceuticals coming from companies with a spotty record. I mean, you've got to be joking. I mean, it's an embarrassment to rational mm -hmm. thought. It's pathetic. I would like to add on to, to, what, uh, to what Jay said. You know, if you look at the next paragraph of, of this document, one of the sentences in there says, Indi influencing individuals to create to violate conviction may sear the conscience, impeding the work of the Holy Spirit, and thus endangering salvation. You know, when a member is told that what they are, they have a sincerely held belief, and when they're told, no, you, you shouldn't have that belief, you can't hold that belief, it's not religious. Maybe you have a personal conviction, but it's not a religious one, and you need to go against mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. You are telling someone essentially to ignore their conscience. This is the process of searing the conscience that the scripture talks about. And, and the other thing that I would like to say, too, is that even if this had been um, chosen by the largest uh, uh, deliberative body in the church, say a general conference or something like that, the person would still have their individual conscience. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I... I I actually like to participate a little bit in evangelism. And when I'm talking to people and we're talking about religion, we're, we're really talking about their conscience. And if their conscience is leading them to a closer relationship with God, if their conscience is leading them to new truth. But, but I never get in the conversation where we're all like, well, maybe we should, rather than consulting your conscience as far as whether you're, you're being led into new truth, we never go as a Protestant to say, well, maybe we should consult your church to see if what you're feeling or, or, or learning right now is true or not. No, we, we, we go to the scripture. We use the scripture to inform the conscience and, and to have any kind of a deliberative body of any kind, any kind that's going to make decisions for the conscience. Um, that actually harkens back to an early, well, a different Christianity, I should say. Um, this is a, a basic premise of the papal system. In the papal system, your beliefs are determined by the magisterium. The magisterium is led by the Pope. And what the magisterium says is true is true, and it better be true for you, too. But that is not Protestantism. That's right. Protestantism says, look, you are saved individually. Everyone will stand before their maker on their own with Christ as their advocate by God's grace, but, but we all approach the judgment seat on our own. Amen. And, and to, to say that anybody is going to make a decision like this for you is, 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 uh, is, is really goes against the heart, the, the, the real core principle of, of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. and, and and it really goes against Christianity. You know, we talk about Protestantism. And if someone says, "Well, when Protestantism start?" You know, fifteen, seventeen, maybe would be the date people would pick. But but honestly, um, I I like to study uh, religious liberty and history, and I, I look all the way back to the Greeks and maybe even dabble in things that go back earlier than that. And what I can say is is that there has always been a stream. There's always been a group of people in Christianity that you can tell have an accurate view of conscience and the desire to follow the conscience and not just follow some magisterium that's telling them what to do. What is very unique is that it wasn't until the American experiment, really with Roger Williams, 
That was the first time that there was ever a government on Earth that recognized that. In the past, the debate was always, there was a debate between church and state and to see which was going to be ascendant. But, and, 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 you know, part of the time the church is running the state and part of the time the state is running the church, but everybody ignored the individual. But then America comes along and says, no, no, no. Roger Williams comes along and says, no, it's the individual. And, and then you can see the outgrowth of that it was just amazing freedom that we have here in America. It's now ebbing away. And it's really, really a sad thing. And, and even non-Christians should care about this because, because a non-Christian, the reason why a non-Christian has liberty of any kind in America is because of Christians. It's because of the Protestant Reformation. It's because of Roger Williams, who was a Puritan pastor. Very well said. Amen. It's kind of interesting to me that as Seventh-day Adventists, we are currently hearing and seeing a re-emphasis on teaching and studying the three angels' messages in Revelation 14. But it's interesting if we read and understand what the first one says, fear God and glory glory to him and worship him that made that's our creator if we go back to genesis when god made things they were good 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 and very good so that sounds like they couldn't be improved upon but now we're being told that to worship god it's okay to take what man has made and put into this creation that god has made and what man has currently uh, been offered is not good, good, and very good. This vaccine, so-called, has been questionable from its very introduction. So if we are Seventh-day Adventists that really do fear God and give glory to our Creator, we should hesitate to uh, push anyone towards a position where they would have to deny giving God precedence in what goes into the body that He made and called very good. Mm. Well, let me let me do this. Let me go around the room here, so to speak. You know, we've got you, we got uh, attorneys, non-attorneys, pastors, non-pastor, men, women. We're trying to trying to mix it all together here and get different perspectives. Um, but let me just throw two things. One is I want you to uh, just kind of say whatever you want to say about this uh, statement. And the other question I have is, do you think that you should sign it or your pastor should sign it? And in the end, I'm going to ask Alvaro if you could talk to us about how a person can sign it. Why Why shouldn't we just um, go and watch the latest entertainment? Why is this thing more important? Uh, is this important to us? Should your pastor find out, uh, possibly sign it? Should your conference hear about it? I don't know. I want to hear from you all and see what your thoughts are about this thing because uh i would say that from what you've all been saying i have to agree conscience isn't i don't see conscience emphasized in any television commercial or in any uh statement coming from the government and i'm afraid to say i haven't seen conscience really emphasized by any statement um emphasized coming even from the church so it, it feels like a desert right now and this this statement to me when i uh, it seems like it's a little bit of an oasis um but i, I just want to hear from you all here before we finish off so maybe we could hear from each one of you in turn uh thoughts about the statement and should you sign it or tell your pastor about it the only thing that really can't be taken away from a person is your freedom of conscience and abel showed that right at the beginning abel and his brother had a disagreement abel decided Abel decided that he was going to follow what God had said, that he was going to honor God, that he was going to worship God in accordance with his conscience, and he died for it. But even though he died for it, he maintained that right of choice. And so the right of dissent, your right to choose to follow your creator, is a sacred right. And it is, at the end of the day, it is the one thing that cannot be taken from you. You know, as far as why this is important. There's never been a time in Earth's history where events are, are accumulating and coming together whereby people can be forced to make a final decision uh, for or against God. And we know at the end, there's people on the left, there's people on the right, and there's nobody in the middle. And this is sort of a warm-up issue. There's never been anything like this in our generation. 
there's in recent memory, there hasn't been an event like this where people were compelled by the state or by the employer to go against what they thought was correct with such serious consequences en masse. And, and so, yes, it's important. As for whether or not you should sign it, that's a matter of personal conviction. I believe I would like to sign it. I haven't done it yet. And I believe I would like to encourage my pastor to look at it and sign it. And for pastors that are maybe not of this mindset, this may help to educate them as to people who are and possibly would swing them over. Another couple of thoughts. You know, we've seen what I call alphabet wars since COVID started. Dr. XYZ argues with Dr. ABC and specialist PDQ, whatever. And people think that they can depend on these people, on these alphabet wars, to decide for them what to do. But the only problem is the Bible says there's a broad road that leads to destruction. And it seems like the whole world is pretty much on this broad road of going down this path that people are being funneled into. But we need to be on a narrow road because ultimate issues have to do with our personal conscience, not with which expert we follow or which trend on the news that we are following. Um, ultimately, we need to be thinking about Revelation 13. What are we willing to die for? What are we willing to not buy ourselves for? And I think it's already been mentioned, if we don't practice, if we don't warm up before the game, we're not going to do so well. So these are very, very serious issues. A statement like this uh, may not immediately have a result in saving someone's job or something like that, but it's a very powerful tool to help us um, review what conscience is and make sure that we are exercising our right of personal conscience. And I want to just add that when I was young, maybe approaching my teens, I remember mom starting to tell us something instead of just saying no you can't go here with your friends or yes you can or no you better not she started saying let your conscience be your guide mm. oh mom why don't you just say no and then i can go whine and complain to my friends mom won't let me do it she wanted to put that on me welcome to adulthood your conscience should be your guide and i hated when she said that but now my mother has just passed away. Mm -hmm. I cannot rely on her conscience or her counsel. I have to stand on what I have been developing all my adult life, letting my own conscience be my guide as informed by the Holy Spirit when I study the Bible, when I pray, uh, when I walk with Jesus myself. And that's why this statement is so important. Alvaro, what about yeah, you? Yeah, very. Thank you, Holly. That was beautiful. And then we'll get to Jonathan. I would say... I, I just want to call attention uh, to the fact that this, this statement that has gone through uh, the hands of many prayerfully mm -hmm. is a statement that is very timely. It's, it's relevant, absolute, uh, absolutely something that we need to talk about, and we need to address and consider. Um, the Apostle Paul makes reference there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2 that in the last days, and, and the Spirit is the one that reveals the fact, revealed it to Paul, and he writes it down. He said in the last days, th there's going to be a, 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 a great deception, deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And so the question of conscience, to understand what it is, how precious, and, and, and this is a gift of God, needs to be something that we need to be ever aware of. And going back to what we were trying to say at the beginning, this is the basis for our belief, the basis for who we are as, as Christians and, and as uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, believers. And so this statement is very timely. Uh, I would encourage everyone to go to, your, go to their pastor, uh, their elders, um, have them um, read it prayerfully, think about it. And I, I, I think that the, a good question would be, is there anything that you see here 
that is wrong. <laughs> you know, what, what's wrong about the statement? Mm -hmm. and, and if it is true, and if it is good, good people who are seeking the truth, <laughs> can we come together and, and let's sign it? If we really believe, if it's a good statement, if we believe it, let's sign it as an encouragement for others. And it's very easy. Um, clergyforconscience.org takes you right to the site, um, has a place there to, to read the document. Then it has a place there to sign the document. And if you've read it, you believe it, then it would be a tremendous help, I believe, and encouragement to others to sign it. Okay. Um, and I think there are hundreds of signers already is what I've, I've heard. Let me go back down here to Jonathan. Jonathan, your your thoughts on the same points as everybody else. You know, um, I would encourage everybody to take the time to read this document carefully. Uh, I've been uh, very impressed with just how carefully it's been written and just the amount of information that's in there. I know that uh, a lot of, for a lot of people, um, in, even for me during much of my career, uh, I didn't have a very sophisticated uh, understanding of religious liberty issues or of the conscience, uh, or even you know how freedom might be threatened. Um, I really believe that if you look at this document and look at it carefully, don't just brush it by quickly and don't just say, hey, I'm in favor of freedom, I'm gonna sign it, but actually read it and think about it. There's a lot of things that are really good in this document, and I think it's a, it's a great tool to help you understand conscience better. And then I would really encourage you to share this as, as far and as wide as you can. Um, it really is directed at clergy, but I, I really, you know, it's anyone can sign it. And it definitely increases the uh, the value of the document the more people that sign it. And then I, I would encourage you to ask anybody that doesn't want to sign it is to ask them why. Yeah. Because um, really, uh, I've looked over this document very, very carefully, and, and I don't pretend to, to be perfect in, in my thinking, but, but I can't see a reason why that someone wouldn't want to sign it unless for some reason they were going to make their conscience subservient to somebody else. If they had some, some other entity or some other thing in their, in their life that they wanted to, to, to elevate, uh, maybe that person wouldn't be interested in this. Um, and it could be a simple thing as just, uh, you know, they don't want to create waves or something like that. But honestly, at the very end, um, we have to learn to stand. Yeah. And one of the things that, uh, that I've been really disturbed with. Uh, I run into this a lot in my practice um, where someone is having their religious liberties impinged upon and they look to me, they're like, can you help me, Jonathan? And I'm like, yes, I'll do my best. But sometimes the courts won't help. And it's really disappointing to me when people fold. And I, I look at them and I'm like, really? You're going to violate your conscience so that you can keep your job? Because honestly, everyone, uh, just as Jay said, everyone has liberty of conscience. It cannot be taken away from you. It absolutely mm -hmm. cannot. Uh, however, uh, there's no question that the powers that be can make your life miserable for exercising that. But we need to exercise that, that muscle of conscience. And, you know, backbone needs to be grown. That's and people right. need to make their backbone stronger. And I'm sure that there's going to be bigger challenges that come our way in the future. And it's, this really is probably just an opening act. So I would really encourage people to go sign this. Um, I really think that it does have value. It will have value sending a message to the broader church. It will have value sending a message to people who are not members of Christianity or, or the Seventh-day Adventist Church because... It will show to them, you know, um, they need to know about conscience. They need to know where freedoms come. And then perhaps it may be even influential in the courts and in the legislatures. So um, just because um, 
you may feel like uh, the vast majority is against you or something like that. This is no reason to to give up and 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 not participate and not have a fight here. Um, this is something that is definitely worth taking a stand on. And so I would encourage people to read it, share it, and engage in conversations. We really need to be able to engage in conversation. If there's anything I really hate right now that I'm seeing is this idea of cancel culture or this idea of you disagree with me, therefore I'm going to hate you. And it's just, it's terrible. And yeah. so we need to, we need to talk about these kinds of things. So share it, talk about it, sign it. Amen. Well, we still can. Amen. <laughs> it's going. Friends, uh, you've, you've all been very articulate tonight. I uh, really appreciate your sharing. Thank you, each one. Any last things to say, or shall we shall we sign off? I have two more short things. You can yes. take them or leave them. I was just reviewing the chapter in Desire of Ages, Liberty of Conscience Threatened. And there's an interesting uh, couple of lines on page 581, uh, the middle of the first full paragraph. It says, let the principle once just once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience. And what's the result? The triumph of, of Rome in this country is assured. So if we allow a church, even our own at first, to dominate our conscience, we are playing into the hands of eventually another church dominating our conscience. That to me is sober. One quick Bible verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, has a lot of short things like rejoice evermore and pray without ceasing, prove all things, etc. And it ends verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's completely. And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It puts it all together, our body, our spirit, our soul, everything we are, that includes our mind. That's where our conscience is. It's all one together, and we need mm -hmm. to preserve it as such unto God. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing your time and your thoughts, and uh, we hope this will be uh, productive. Again, uh, everybody should read it and figure out what, what to do with it. On Friday, I figured it out for me. But anyway, take a look. Thank you, each one, and uh, keep on finding the right path. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Larry. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot for setting it up. Take Enjoy. care. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Uh,